Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Louise Mistel. I'm the executive director of uh, Sky Island Alliance and happy to see all of you here with us this morning. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to our volunteers and our supporters who make all this work possible that we're going to be talking about um, today and at our coffee breaks through the year. So thank you for your dedication to the amazing Sky Islands and for all you do to keep them thriving. And uh, today I'm coming to you from Tucson, Arizona, where the Sky Island Alliance offices are, and it is on the land of the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki people and other indigenous peoples. And our work throughout the Sky Island region on both sides of the US-Mexico border takes place on indigenous lands. And I think as we talk about the border wall, um, it's really important to hold this in our minds because the Tohono O'odham and Hasid O'odham have been really impacted by the border wall that we're talking about today. So we're trying to do our part to acknowledge the lack of truth and reconciliation with Native nations and educate ourselves uh, and mobilize to stand in solidarity. And you can uh, learn more about what we're doing and, and get some resources if you're interested on our website. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll move into our program. Um, I'm excited to welcome Program Director Emily Burns and Lighthawk Volunteer Pilot Greg Bettinger, who are gonna take us on an amazing tour of the borderlands. Great, well, thank you so much, Louise, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here speaking with you, uh, with all of you. And um, Greg Bettinger and I have been talking about what's been happening along our border in Southeast Arizona for an, a couple of years now. And I'm really excited to expand the conversation and bring you all into it. Greg is a volunteer pilot, pi uh, pilot with the organization Lighthawk. And this is an organization that's dedicated to using aerial imagery to help advance conservation on the ground. And it's been a really natural fit for us to work with, with Greg and with Lighthawk, as we're very concerned and interested in monitoring the state of the border. We chose to do this conversation with you all today on January 20th, because it's the one year anniversary of Biden's inauguration. And if any of you were like me, we we're kind of counting down the hours a year ago <laughs> at this time of day, it was still the, the final hours of the Trump administration. And all eyes were really watching down here in the borderlands. What was President Biden going to do? What actions was he gonna take around the border and the border wall? Um, it was later in the afternoon on January 20th, 2021, when the proclamation came out of the Oval Office that Biden was stopping border wall construction and gave the construction crews along the whole US-Mexico border a seven day grace period to wind down their activities. So what they were supposed to be doing was tidying up the work, preparing these massive construction sites to be left so that the project funding could go under financial review. Many of us were going down to the borderlands to watch and see what was happening. Did, were we gonna see heavy equipment going away from the border? Uh, was all the construction gonna immediately stop on January 20th? And it was a little horrifying to see that not being the case. We saw breakneck pace construction happening in the Huachuca Mountains and the Patagonia Mountains. It felt to many of us that we weren't just seeing uh, the security of sites in order to leave them. There was continued road building. But after seven days, it did, it did wind down. And we waited until April of last year um, for more news. And that's when the Department of Defense did say that the contracts that were funded from Department of Defense fin uh, funding sources would be canceled, which was great news for Arizona. All of the con construction contracts that were in place in Arizona were funded from those sources. Unfortunately, that didn't cover other states, other places where congressionally appropriated funding from, from Congress was still in place for border construction, and that remains an issue today. And so when we think about the border beyond our part of Arizona, we need to think about construction risk in California and in Texas. And in fact, we are hearing and seeing reports of wall construction happening in both of those states. 
So where are we today? Here it's the one year anniversary. I'm gonna to come to this again at the end of our presentation this morning, but we do have an opportunity as, a, as, a, as the public to provide some comments to Customs and Border Patrol, who is now authorized to do activities along the border in the Tucson sector, which is a 119 mile stretch on the Eastern side of our state. So I'll come back to that and we invite you to work with us over the next week to prepare comments and to submit them to Border Patrol in hopes that we can have some better environmental outcomes in 2022. Okay, so now we're going to step off the ground. We're gonna go into the sky and we're gonna to start today with a video that Greg and I have put together to showcase um, some of the wonderful videos and photos that Greg has taken from the air in his plane. So this is about just over five minutes and give me a moment and I will get that playing for you. Lighthawk volunteer pilot, Greg Bettinger has witnessed border changes for years, flying over Southeast Arizona and Northern Mexico. I grew up in an aviation family. Uh, we had a small plane as a second car living in Alaska. That's how people got around back then. And um, I just have always had a lifelong fascination with, actually as much of the fascination has been with looking out the window as it has been with flying. The flying came many years later. Greg routinely flies over the border in Arizona to document how wall construction is changing the landscape. Up close, the border's impact is shocking and immediate. From further away, the border is somehow even stranger and begs the question, why have we split a single landscape in two? Blocking movement through North America in a variety of ways. When you're on the ground, depending on where you are, if, if you're standing close to the new wall, the 30-footer, um, it's pretty imposing. Um, where it's dropped down to the uh, lower sections that were built you know, prior to two or three years ago, that too kind of leaves an impression of uh, unscalability. But from the air, unless you're really looking for that transition from height, um, it's it's hard to judge scale sometimes unless you have you know a car or a truck uh, heavy equipment or where it runs through towns um, until you have that from the air it can look quite small and tiny and silly <laughs> it's it's hard not to come away with a feeling of why would they spend that kind of money on this barrier that really, for all practical purposes, this doesn't really uh, accomplish what they're after. In the final years of the Trump administration, environmental laws were waived along the border and wall construction happened quickly across federal lands in Arizona. When the wall construction was paused in January 2021, Approximately two thirds of Arizona's border with Sonora was already blocked off. There are now only a few places where the wall hasn't split the landscape in two. That's what flying is all about, is just being witness to all that. Lighthawk mobilizes volunteer pilots like Greg to help conservation organizations monitor the landscape and tell the stories of both environmental degradation and conservation. Really the goal, the mission is to uh, utilize the power of these aerial views to advance, you know, conservation efforts for groups like yours. Greg's aerial reconnaissance is helping Sky Island Alliance and its partners identify and advocate for restoration of land damaged by the wall, including construction staging areas and water crossings. Uh, these areas were staging areas for sections of wall, 
um, sections of the old border walls that had been removed, um, staging of construction materials like uh, you know the environmental barriers, the concrete barriers, uh, light standards, trucks, heavy equipment, all of that. One of the things that I've tried to capture for all of the wall is where the wall just flat out interrupts uh, water drainage across the border. A lot of areas they've made accommodation for it that may or may not be working. Other areas the wall just goes down into a draw, down into a wash, and continues on as though it was never there. It just seems like folly and ill-spent money. You know, if all they did was build a road and patrol it heavily, <laughs> put some sensors and things along the way, and uh, maybe use some drones, they could probably do away with the wall and wildlife wouldn't um, do better than, you know, a physical border wall. If everything looked like the San Rafael or the reservation lands, um, I think that would be a good goal. Okay, well, Greg, it's, it's been a pleasure to tell the story with you. And certainly in the coming years, we're going to be continuing to tell the story because the fate of the border wall and the U.S.-Mexico border um, is, is not sealed. It certainly continues to evolve um, and changing all the time. Nature is having its impact on where border construction has happened and the policy continues to, to change and evolve. So uh, we're just going to talk now together about a couple of places on the landscape and, and your observations. Um, but welcome, Greg. Thank you for sharing all of your Thank dedication you. up to the borderlands with us this morning. It's been my pleasure. And I'm always looking for an opportunity to fly. And this has been a great fit. So. Well, our experiences are so different because mine working on the border, studying the wildlife is very much on the ground. You know, I see the border from the distance or I'm actually up next to it using the border road to get to different field sites. And so for me, my perspective is always just the shock of, of looking up at a steel border wall that's almost the, the full length of a utility pole that we would find in our neighborhoods. Um, but of course, that's really different, right? I mean, for you in the air, the perspective of the wall is, is fundamentally different. Can you share a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I think the biggest takeaway for me is just been how uh, it shows up in areas that you just don't see a need for any kind of a barrier. There's so many physical barriers. Uh, geographic barriers in place already. So I, I get back to my point of feeling like there are much better ways to spend the money uh, to create the kind of uh, patrolled crossing if that's actually their intent uh, mm -hmm. and not impact <clears throat> conservation efforts as strongly as they do. Great. Yeah. Well, the aerial perspective, um, I think for me in so many ways, when I saw the photos, it really gave me a sense of just how long the border wall is. You can read in the newspaper about how many hundreds of miles have been created. And I know the statistic, two thirds of Arizona's southern border is now walled off. But when you see it just going on and on and on, cutting through mountains, like you say, used to be natural barriers, it, it is sort of shocking about how much infrastructure has already been put in. And the further and further we go away from the border or higher in the air, it becomes less visible. And I know it's important to all of us that we don't forget what's happened, you know, that we continue to bear witness and remember no matter where people are in our country or in Mexico, remember that now this wall is standing and it's, it's a legacy that we need to change. Totally agree. And you're right. Uh, I've made notes, the higher you get, the, the less you can see uh, of political barriers like the wall. 
um, uh, and most of the time you just can't see that from any kind of altitude even in a small plane you have to get relatively low to understand the impact um, not just the scale of something like the wall but the impact it has on wildlife obvious wildlife crossings parallel to water crossings so um, that's one of the benefits of being a small plane pilot is being able to share that view with people uh, like yourself and other conservation groups to get them out and see it for themselves. Uh, it's been hard the last couple of years because Lighthawk up until just a few months back decided uh, to stop carrying passengers mm -hmm. because of COVID and that's resumed and it's kind of up to individual pilots now to do that. But that means that legislators uh, and people that really have the power to make change haven't had as many opportunities to get out and see the damage that's been done and see the construction and see the scale of all this. So hopefully that'll change in the coming months. Great. Well, I want to uh, start showing some of the photographs um, that you've been taking over the years and just say, even though we, I wasn't up in the plane myself and those of us who are watching weren't part of it, now we have access to what you were seeing. And for Sky Island Alliance, we were getting our first images of what the actual construction damage was because we were excluded from the areas even where we had research permits, we weren't able to go into the active construction zones. And some of that is still in place today. So really this, this monitoring, being able to document where the roads were being carved in, so much of that came out from pilots like you, drone pilots that were able to get some eyes from above um, and bear witness to that. All right, so I'm gonna pull up some slides that we can talk about. Greg. And um, for everyone who's joining us today, we're going to be talking about two particular places in Arizona. Honestly, we could be talking to you for days, <laughs> and we will continue this conversation to spotlight different parts of the border. But today we're going to talk about where the San, where the San Pedro River crosses over the border, and then we're going to talk about the Huachuca Mountains. These are two contrasting habitats that have incredible value to um, numerous plant and animal species. They're important for recreation and they've been heavily impacted by well construction. So we'll start here um, just west of Naco um, at the San Pedro River crossing. And we're, we're fortunate, Greg, that you were flying um, uh, with a friend in, in the early years before the construction actually crossed fully through uh, the San Pedro River. So right. do you wanna share a little bit about these first, you know, quote unquote, before images? Yeah, well, this was actually the last passenger flight I conducted before COVID down. And uh, I was fortunate to carry Frank Staub, a, a Tucson-based photographer, a conservation photographer, extraordinaire actually, and uh, some members from the Coalition for Sonoran Desert Protection. And our goal on that flight actually was to uh, track through the San Rafael Valley and the San Pedro, knowing that wall construction was going to impact uh, the San Pedro for sure before too long. So uh, managed to give Frank quite a tour. And even though it was winter, uh, it, it gave some pretty good uh, images for you to use in the before times, as we're calling them now. So, yeah, Frank's uh, been uh, a great contributor to a lot of uh, conservation efforts in, in Arizona. Well, here's a zoomed in image of what the San Pedro looked like that winter. And this is when we were racing to get our wildlife cameras out in the Huachuca Mountains and, and west through the Patagonia Mountains, including the San Rafael. <clears throat> Um, the San Pedro River, um, until the damage that was inflicted by the border wall, it was considered the last undammed river in the southwest. It's a uh, habitat for 18 federally listed or proposed for listing species. It's, the San Pedro River is home to 600 different plants, including two native fish species. So the value of this riparian corridor is, is so high. Um, and I think for all of us, we just cringed when we realized that they were going to attempt to trench across the river. You can see what it looked like at this point before they did that. There was some wall on the eastern side. Um, you can see a, a vehicle, a board, probably a border patrol vehicle parked near the end of the wall. Um, and then went to low vehicle barrier 
which are steel cross pieces that prevent vehicles from moving back and forth, but are still fairly permeable to wildlife. And natural flow and the riparian gallery of trees right there at the border were intact. Um, a few other images that give you some perspective of, of what the infrastructure looked like. Okay, so this, this next photo was just a few months later, so switching from February to June of 2020, um, and construction was beginning. Um, on the right side of the screen, you can see a, a small crane that was there to begin um, with the installation of the bollards. Construction of the wall um, and a staging area is visible on the left side of the photo, um, and that's east towards uh, NACO. You can zoom in a little bit here. Um, and you can imagine if you're a jaguar walking from Sonora, a male looking for new territory, looking for uh, a place to, to live, you might clearly be coming up through this area. And indeed, it's designated critical habitat for jaguar because there were 84 different federal laws and statutes waived along the border. Um, it meant that no environmental studies or review were done. Um, what was known about jaguar and jaguar habitat, it didn't have any bearing on the outcome with the border construction. And then this is what it looked like this year. So Greg flew again in May, and you can see that there are wall segments now between the cottonwood trees right at the border. And they also put in a, a cement bridge um, for Border Patrol to be going back and forth across. So now they actually are able to drive in the drive all the way across the border where that wasn't possible before. And then just a closer look at the road. It looks like they didn't maybe get to everything that they intended to do in terms of stabilizing the road. Um, on the right-hand side of the photograph, it looks like there's some erosion around the road. That's a really common thing um, that we, we are seeing. And this was in May. This was before the super monsoon happened. Um, but certainly these are in, this is infrastructure that's been created now that um, I kind of hate to think about how much money it might take uh, for them to maintain the structures if they're committed to it. Um, and we might be seeing continued environmental damage from these structures, eroding, losing more plant habitat, um, and having continued construction crews coming trying to repair it. So th those are some of the things we're concerned about. And this photo, it's a little grainy, but this, um, this was just in August. And mostly we just put this in here to show the, how there was a lot of greening up of the surrounding habitat. Okay, also in August, we had these great photographs from on the ground and what it looked like when water was, um, a good amount of water was flowing through the San Pedro. When the border wall was put across the San Pedro, gates were installed. And unfortunately, when they were installed, they were tack welded shut. <laughs> um, but our conservation colleagues out on the ground noticed that and uh, sent up a smoke signal saying this is disastrous. It's disastrous for the river and the communities um, to not have the floodgates open. So those were unwelded. And we were happy to see that the floodgates were open, um, at least in August, when a lot of water was flowing through. Um, at another point in August, the water level had dropped down. But you can see, of course, this is such a major waterway. A lot of debris uh, was piling up. Other places along the border weren't this lucky. Uh, the, the floodwaters must have caught the gates by surprise. The gates swung the wrong way. Um, huge log jams of debris. So really what they're doing is they've created some passageways. And this is a good news. This is good news for wildlife in terms of being able to cross when these gates are open, but they are closing them then when water isn't flowing. Um, and that's one thing that we would definitely like to see as an immediate change that anywhere where we have gates across a waterway that they remain open because these are clear wildlife corridors. Greg, any other things you wanna share about the San Pedro? No, just that, um, you know, when you look at the this photo in particular, uh, it would not take much for whoever took this photo to walk to the other side and shoot back into the US. It just, to me, highlights uh, kind of the, 
lack of real immigration control that you can acquire from something like this. Um, I don't know. It just reinforces for me that it could be uh, the money could be spent in so many other ways, even even along the border, if that was really their intent. So, sorry for the political part of it, but <laughs> I I don't get to see this from the air. I get some of the uh, impact uh, on both sides of a a bridge or a gate like this. You can certainly see the impacts downstream, and uh, some of the photos from the air even illustrate. Uh, especially over at Silver Creek and some of those places, how much damage has been done just by three or four days worth of uh, heavy monsoon flooding. So, Right. Well, certainly there are many ways, as you said, to do surveillance along the border that don't require this type of steel bollard infrastructure that is really problematic for a variety of reasons. Um, I mean, to me now, knowing what they're planning on doing in other parts of the contiguous wall, these openings look relatively big and I'll take it <laughs> if they would just leave them open. Sure. There are so many animals that would be able to move through. For typical highway crossings, for federal highway um, administration projects, when they're doing wildlife crossings, every mile or so, they are supposed to be putting in crossings. If it's an underpass, they're supposed to be at least 32 feet wide. Um, so there are federal guidelines about this, about highways, and this is the, a similar kind of infrastructure, but it's not being held to the same sort of, of standards, certainly. Um, unfortunately, the proposal by Border Patrol for the Tucson sector for, in part of their current remediation plan is to install small wildlife openings, but they'd only be eight and a half by 11 inches. So that's the size of a piece of printer paper. And you can imagine that there aren't too many animals that are actually gonna be able to physically squeeze through there or would feel safe doing so. Um, so that's just something to be thinking thinking about. And I will be asking people to send Border Patrol their, their comments on this in particular, the issue of the size of and the frequency of wildlife crossings in the border. Okay, so now we're going to travel a little bit further west um, into the Huachuca Mountains. The Huachuca Mountains are um, an amazing mountain range. They're home to ocelot. There are ocelot individuals that are documented um, in the mountains right now. That's a beautiful tropical cat species. And the spine of where the Huachuca Mountains crosses over into Sonora is considered one of those really important uh, wildlife pathways for large cats like ocelot and jaguar. And where this arrow is pointing is right at the spine. The Arizona Trail comes down to that point. It's been an incredibly important place for recreation. Um, there are many cultural values in this landscape and it's all federally owned um, and managed by the National Park Service and the US Forest Service which means unfortunately that it was subject to some of these early building contracts because no imminent domain was required to do border wall construction on federal lands. Okay, so flashing back to the, the past, Greg, here <laughs> with an early flight that you did before construction started in the Huachucas. You wanna say a little bit about this? I'm sorry, you were blocked. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> well, I was, Air I'm, Force is active today, so we've had a few jets flying over. I've had to mute out here. So, um, I so I'm just showing this. Could first, you repeat what your question was about this? Yeah, just this is the first image that we have in a time series of what was happening on the eastern slopes of the Huachuca Mountains. We're looking at National Park Service land. This is Coronado National memorial on the lower half of the screen. And you can see a section of old border wall. Um, this was 18 foot border wall that was put in several decades ago. I believe it was the construction was finished around 2008. And what's interesting is when you're in Coronado National Memorial and you're driving west into the park, you see the end of the wall. You used to be able to see the end of the wall um, and the road continued on a tiny bit but it ended. Um, and so that, that you saw that, right? A few years ago, Greg? Right, right, sorry. Yeah, and uh, I didn't know at the time that they had planned to uh, 
do the level of construction that they did on both sides of the, the high peaks there to try and extend the wall, uh, which are more visible on the next photos uh, a couple of years later. Right. So here was before that construction um, extension happens, but you can see a transition from the, the older wall that was much shorter, and then it switches into vehicle barrier um, for a portion of the road until it stopped. And then looking now at what it actually looked like in May of this year, um, the switchbacks, we begin we began to see this in 2020, uh, 20, yeah, 2020, um, we saw the first construction equipment come in and they created a, sta a staging area just to the east of Coronado National Memorial. And we started to see the bulldozers and heavy equipment go up these Eastern slopes of the Huachucas. Um, and it was your photos that really made us realize, wow, those are some crazy switchbacks they're creating. <laughs> yeah. going to zoom in on the wall here so you can see the change in height. There aren't very many places where we can see that change from uh, the 18 foot wall that was put in in previous presidential administrations and then what the Trump administration's increase in height is. But if you look here, you can see it, it goes up to the new height. And this was a pretty steep grade. So you can see they did a ton of back and forth switchbacks up the mountainside. Most of the equipment that we've photographed in these areas are, I don't know if they're borrowed from the mines or not, but they're, they're the huge dump trucks and large bulldozers that have the capacity to climb these steep slopes and take quite a bit at one, one pass. So. Um, I think some of that was done uh, in anticipation of a stop work order that came in the change of administrations. Right. Well, the intention with this particular contract was to have the contractors go from this point where the wall was initiated for 2.1 miles running west. So completely over the Wichuca Mountains down yeah. into the San Rafael Valley. Um, and they started on the slopes on both sides and we'll get to that. And then in the, in the middle, they'd only done a little bit, um, but you can see here just in August, this last August during the monsoon, um, there's some greening, greening up of the landscape, which is wonderful, but these roads certainly don't appear to anyone like they're going to be stable. And it, it's our recommendation uh, to Customs and Border Patrol that this is a road that doesn't need to exist. It's really a road to nowhere. And we hope that they will retire it as opposed to continually trying to uh, stabilize the switchbacks on this national park. This shows a little bit closer view of the uh, extreme erosion that's happening below the red, the road bed surface. Okay, so this is <clears throat> moving back to May. So it's dark, uh, it's more brown because it was in May before the monsoon season. This is a little bit west of where we were just looking. And this is in the middle Huachuca Mountains along the border. They put in more switchbacks in the middle section um, and they were building road there even past the inauguration date, like through the end of January of last year, we were seeing continuing road building in this particular location. The good news is the road doesn't fully connect. So it doesn't actually completely go over um, the Huachuca Mountains, there's a segment here that hasn't actually come down. Now, we don't know for sure what will happen. The options are they could decide these roads were a bad idea and they retire them and we work on actual uh, habitat restoration and road removal, or they may decide they're gonna keep the segments of road that they have and maintain them, or they might decide to continue the road. If they are, if they do continue the road, that will be under the um, idea that it's for human safety, that they need to be able to drive and patrol through this. Um, but my hope that the really steep area here in the central which you guys will prevent that. Um, so Greg, on your flights, you are certainly seeing the heavy equipment down, down here in the middle, which you guys as well, right? Yeah, eight months after the inauguration. 
um, we were seeing this. And I, I don't know if we are showing any of this in the photos today, but it's, it's good to point out that the vantage point I have looking down on this area, um, I'm almost over another road, <laughs> the main forest service road that transects uh, east to west through the San Rafael Valley. So it's not like there aren't roads that Border Patrol is currently utilizing. Um, and these areas that are challenging at best for uh, people on foot to be able to navigate through, so. Yeah, well, that's a really good point. There are There is a parallel existing road that's heavily used by park visitors, forest visitors, and um, Border Patrol is using. So there is a natural um, surveillance yeah. road already. So now we're going to do before and after for the western side of the Wichuca Mountains. And what we are looking at here is the original border road that was going that goes through it runs all the way through the Patagonia Mountains across the Santa Cruz River, um, where it flows from Arizona down into Sonora before it does a, a U bend it comes back into Arizona um, near Kino Springs between the pa Patagonia Mountains and Nogales. So this border road um, has been in existence it's had barbed wire fence, it's had steel vehicle barrier for a very long time. Um, and just like on the other side of the mountains, originally the road, the border road just kind of goes up and then it kind of just stopped. At some point there was the last vehicle barrier and it just went into rugged terrain with the Montezuma Pass above it. Here's a picture of the end of the wall taken in February, so winter 2020, um, with none of the road construction or wall construction obvious, had, hadn't started yet. These are the steel vehicle barriers. And it's hard to gauge how steep this is, but this is really steep terrain, folks. Like you can't, you could hike up there, you know, if you're really fit, of course, um, and it's possible if you're walking along the border, but it is very steep. And it's, there's an obvious reason why they decided, oh, uh, let's not bother putting in any vehicle barrier. It's not needed up here. <laughs> And here's a perspective of standing on that border road, looking up into that um, end of the road that I was just showing you. And here's before construction started. And then when they started putting in the switchbacks to go up onto the Montezuma Pass, uh, where the Arizona Trail comes down the spine of the Huachuca Mountains. In order to install wall on the Montezuma Pass where at the terminus of the Arizona Trail, um, the construction company was using dynamite like they did at many other mountain crossings along the border. Um, the plastic that you're seeing are sites where dynamite was put into the mountain. And here's what how the, the, the border was marked prior to this construction activity. This is one of the border monuments that you can see in multiple places along the border. Um, I've heard that they are originally installed to a line of sight. So people could always look east or west and apparently be able to see the next mile marker. Now in most places, there's so many other parts of the border infrastructure, they're pretty hard to see, but I know you've seen them a lot from the air, Greg. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is where the trail came down and I'm sure countless hikers have taken photos <laughs> right there at the fence line with this border marker. But unfortunately on January 6th last year they installed steel border wall all the way up to that border marker and there's about a quarter mile stretch now that has um, steel wall right at the, the trails terminus. And here are just two views of what this wall looks like. Um, it's the 30 foot tall wall, but it is just, a, it is a fragment and it really stands as this uh, ridiculous wall segment on the top of the Huachuca Mountains. An incredible amount of mountainside removal was done, habitat was lost, this road has been carved in and a lot of environmental damage was caused that could we could work towards healing. Some of the scar will always remain. Um, but clearly these bollards don't need to be here in this location. And this photo overall really 
uh, illustrated to me, Greg, just what you, what you were seeing from the air, just the ridiculousness of this tiny stretch of wall at the top of, of the Montezuma Pass. And then another illustration of these roads that they created, these switchback roads that go up the sides of the mountain that are crumbling. And this is a view standing up on that switchback road, looking down at the border. You can see the border original fence line and vehicle bar barrier going west into the San Rafael Valley. There were some attempts by the construction companies to transplant agave from areas that they were uh, parking their equipment where they started so construction activities. Um, it seemed to us and to our volunteers that were, that were out there doing field research and, and monitoring that their, the success rate of the transplants was really low. Clearly there's opportunities to do uh, native plant revegetation in these places. And we're really excited to work with the land managers on this um, as we regain access into the border construction areas. Right now in the border remediation plan that's proposed for the Tucson sector, all they're planning on doing is having the contractors do seeding, seeding of disturbed ground areas. And of course, we're a little nervous about that. What seeds are they going to use <laughs> um, and, and, how, and how will this actually get revegetated? So we're hoping that the land managers will actually have significant input and maybe control as well over the revegetation of the retired construction areas. Well, I'm gonna wrap up here with talking about some next steps that we're taking. But before I do that, Greg, and we'll open it up to questions. Do you have any any final thoughts you wanna share about the Huachucas or, or other parts of the border? Well, I I think the takeaway for me on this, I, I made a note of this yesterday. I think I sent it to you as uh, hour identified from past flights and photos that I want to revisit. And looking at this presentation today, it just reinforces uh, the value of imagery in uh, helping people understand what's going on down there. And it re-inspires me to go back and look. Um, I am shooting a camera out the window and keeping the airplane right side up at the same time. So going back and looking at these images um, kind of helps me map out areas I want to return to and uh, just do kind of a timeline approach to it, but also just to see how things are faring. Now that we've come through a full monsoon season, a big one, and we've actually had some good rains already this winter. Uh, I'll be interested to be back down there later this month or next month and just see how things are doing. So, but it's an ongoing project. It's, it's, it's kind of a new phase now. So I, I see some uh, need for continued image gathering and probably more of a need now to get more, more eyes in the eye. Well, thank you, Greg. Thank you for doing that. All, all of his flights, um, he does as a volunteer with his own plane. And it's, it's just tremendous that you and your other volunteer pilots are doing this. We so appreciate it. Um, we will continue to share the photos that Greg is taking along the border. Um, so we can all continue to watch what's happening at the southern border. And I just wanna share a few ways that you can get involved and support us as a community working on improving conditions along the border. Here's a map of the border barrier remediation plan that's gonna affect three counties in uh, Arizona. We are the first sector that has the sort of remediation plan being proposed by Customs and Border Patrol, but we're waiting to see the next ones that will be coming out. So like I mentioned before, it's a 119 mile stretch from Cabeza Prieta uh, National Wildlife Refuge all the way to the New Mexico border. There is a little bit of unwalled uh, border to our neighboring state to the east of New Mexico, but most of New Mexico was walled off during, um, during the Trump administration. So 
the kid almost contiguous wall stretches across these two states is, is really pretty staggering. You can go and check out this map that Customs and Border Patrol has put out for the public. They're soliciting comments and feedback directly through this map portal. Um, and you can also provide written letters and there's an email address to submit that. This map is uh, has a lot of information and it's missing a lot of information. But what's sort of fun is you can go in and actually look at different types of proposed actions. They don't give a lot of detail about the actions, um, but where they might be doing culvert improvements, where they might be doing this reseeding of construction landing areas, and where where they will be considering whether they should reinforce road or potentially remove it. So there are tremendous opportunities for you to go in and actually add comments and feedback in the map portal. Um, with my colleague, uh, Miles Traphagen from Wildlands Network next Friday at, uh, I should switch slides, next Friday at 1.30, we are going to walk through the Tucson sector and show you this map. We will share our ideas about best environmental messaging to be putting into comment letters. And we can together be putting our feedback into the map portal. So we have a lot of on the ground information about where we've seen these erosion sites, where we see big problems, where we think there need to be wildlife crossings installed. We wanna share that with all of you and invite you to submit those comments. So please register for this webinar. If the date and time doesn't work for you, it will be recorded and you can watch and follow along and submit your comments um, at a time that's better for you. All of the comments will be due by February 3rd. So it's really important that over the next two weeks, this becomes a focus of our community advocacy for the border. And lastly, um, to help all of us be able to um, organize volunteers like Greg and to be part of the Border Coalition advocating for change in Washington, D.C., meeting with Department of Homeland Security and Border Patrol about these exact issues, we really need your support. And we hope that you'd be willing to make a contribution to our Border Research and Recovery Fund. With that, I'm going to open it up to any questions that you might have um, for Greg and myself. And thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Okay. So are there any questions? Okay. I'm just catching up on the chat here. Emily and Greg. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Greg for his images because it is totally impressive. Those 30 foot steel barriers underneath into the waterway, um, the amazing amount of money and expertise that has gone into this that will then have to be reversed <laughs> at some po particular point in time. It's, it's really a very important com uh, component of what the goal is here, which is the visual images uh, to educate all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. I'm not seeing any more questions yet in the chat, but. Um, but um, Hello? Oh, here we go. So, here I, I was wondering what role you think um, UAVs or drones would have in aerial uh, imagery uh, work in the future. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, it's a great question. And we and have, we relied on. Oops, feedback. Okay, great. Um, yeah, the, the drone footage is, is sort of this great halfway between on the ground perspective and what Greg is showing at the larger scale of the landscape. Drones are great for shorter distance surveillance. And the video that we showed at the beginning did include um, drone footage that had been taken by the Wildlands Network by Miles Traphagen. 
So we find that it's really important. We would love to get more documentation when water is flowing across the border about where is it actually flowing? <laughs> where is it getting stopped? Where are we seeing erosion problems? And it can be a great way to get that perspective with drones. Um, so we are interested um, in continuing to have that kind of uh, surveillance done as well. I just add that um, drones have some restrictions and limitations uh, mm -hmm. that the airplanes don't. And one of them is uh, a restriction against flying within national park lands. And I'm not sure about the monument lands, but they are more restricted by regulation. Um, but Emily had asked me uh, last year about, could we do any night flights down along the border and see what kind of impact the uh, light standards that they've placed along the roads and potential for problems from that. Mm, Greg, you're cutting out a little bit, but I'll just pick up on where- border, <laughs> It'd be a little dangerous. Than, yeah. Oh, sorry, Greg, you've been cutting out. We couldn't quite catch that. But okay. you, you were talking about the how dangerous it is for these for planes to be flying low. And um, we've been really wanting to understand the lights, the light stadium lighting that's been that's gone on, been installed along the border. In some places it hasn't yet been turned on, which is good. We like it to stay that way. Um, but it's I'm guessing Greg was gonna say that that also is a great way that drones could help if it was safe for them to fly at night since we can't do the aerial photography right. from planes. There is a, a comment in the chat that you might want to just respond to about um, if they won't remove the entire wall, can they open sections in primaries for wildlife, such as river crossings? Um, and I know we've given that a lot of thought and done some work on that. So I'll just let you comment on that. I mean, the answer is yes. And I think we all need to be shouting from the rooftops that that's necessary. Um, if we don't allow the border wall to be permeable to wildlife, we're not letting populations of animals move back and forth and carry their genes and their genetic diversity with them. In this era of climate change, where animals need to be able to move to find resources in our changing climate and changing environment, we can't have a complete wall across the continent um, and that will be really bad for the species. So some of the asks that we're gonna be making is like I mentioned, where there are gates, can those be left open? Um, if those could be open, at least those are some places where animals can cross. Unfortunately, the uh, Department of Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas has said that wall gaps will be closed. Um, so it's not exactly in line with what I'm talking about with keeping gaps and creating them <laughs> and making and, and opening up um, gates, but there will be places in Arizona where smaller, we, we understand that they will be smaller stretches of, of wall will be placed in where the wall didn't meet. Many of those are planned, they were planned to have gates and the gates weren't installed. So unfortunately, I do think some places are, are going to have more wall and more closure. The small openings, we don't yet have a sense of exactly how many of those might be going in. Again, those are the eight and a half by 11 really small wildlife openings. Um, there are some examples of those, I believe in Oregon pipe. Um, I've heard that in Texas, they've had those installed and they've monitored them, monitored them with cameras and they only caught one cottontail, I think, going through that small size opening. So in this common period, I think it's great for us to be advocating for, we need very frequent wildlife crossings. They need to be open all year round and they need to be at a sufficient size that won't repel animals um, that will actually facilitate their ability to move across the border. And we'll give some more details about that next week. Emily, could, could yeah. I just jump in? This is, this is a comment that I had made. Um, and my point was, instead of talking about wildlife, try to do it from what would facilitate for the border patrol and, you know, use the thought process that maybe this could focus border patrol um, monitoring to a smaller specific areas, which would be easier for any illegal traffic to use because it's already open and then easier to monitor. So try to do it from that vantage point rather than what's better for wildlife, which many people probably don't care about. So that that's where I was going. Mm. Well, I think that's, it's pragmatic to realize that, you know, their main priority is, is securing the border from, from traffic across the border. Um, 
the the places that we've been focusing on and talking about the new wall building these are places where for many years border patrol said it was unnecessary to have a wall and that they were able to sufficiently patrol it um so that that does that's it's just it's a really good point um we do want our environmental laws to be restated uh reinstated we we want the the law waivers like nepa that have affected and removed nepa to be removed so we're going to continue to be a voice for wildlife, understanding that's not going to influence everyone, but right now we want to also be the voice for those animals um, that are being stopped at the wall. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, oh, well, there was, sorry, there was one question I didn't get to you about how to get the map. I'm assuming, well, I'll let you answer. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a map that can, there's a story map page uh, link that if it's not in the chat um, on a, it is in the chat. So maybe if you just scroll up a tiny bit, you'll see it. We'll be posting a lot of information about this and we'll be focusing on navigating that web map link in our next webinar workshop next Friday. Okay, so Anna just shared it here, and this is a story map. So it has an overview at the top about the type of actions they're proposing to take. And then it goes through different sections of the Tucson sector, gives some photos that illustrate various things about the type of problem or project they want to address. And you can click on individual markers along the border and see sometimes more photos or a little bit more detail about what they're proposing. And those pop-up windows are where you can put in direct comments there. Hi, Emily, I have a question. Um, the, I, I'm really looking forward to the workshop on the 28th, mm -hmm. but in the meantime, will there be some talking points or other guidance on the, on the Sky on Alliance page to help us with our comments? Yeah, that's what we're working on, Elaine, and we will have all the information available on the 28th. As we get more information together, we'll post it as we can, but okay. we will have, it will give you over a week to submit your comments from the 28th. So we are analyzing okay. the whole border. We've only had this information for a few weeks and going as fast as we can. But yes, okay. our goal is to have a draft comment letter that you could take and personalize an email to Customs and Border Patrol. Customs and Border Patrol is the agency that is doing this remediation plan. They will be putting out a request for proposals for contractors, hiring the contractors and overseeing all of the work that they're proposing. So this is really gonna be a Border Patrol project. Um, so we'll have a letter to them that you can use. And then we will also show people and provide specific comments for individual locations on the map on Friday. Wow. But we're, Good. we're working around the clock to get all that together. So I don't have it no, to share today. I, I didn't, I wasn't implying that it wasn't happening fast enough. I just wanted to get myself prepped so that yeah. I'm ready to go on the 28th. That's agreed. Yes. For me yes. to be ready to go. You guys. Yeah, we'll we'll have everything for sure all lined up for everybody by the 28th. And if we get <laughs> stuff together sooner, we'll be getting that up on our webpage for sure. Okay. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. Um, it's taking all of us to keep our eyes on the border and to document what's happening. And um, I really um, am appreciative of you all spending the time with us this morning to get up to speed on what's happening. And please join us next Friday. All right, thank you, Greg. Thank you, it's been my pleasure to help.